Thank you very much for that speech. And I now look to Leslie Hook to conclude the case for the opposition and the debate as a whole. Hear, hear. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here tonight. It's an honor to be here and participate in this debate. Although, I'm not even sure we're having a debate anymore. It feels like there's a lot of agreement uh, in this room. I'm a journalist who's been covering climate change for some time, and I deal with the written word, not the spoken word, so you'll have to bear with me. And I also speak American, so hopefully you can still understand me at the back. In the US, where I come from, we have a president who says that wind turbines cause cancer. And whenever winter comes around and it gets cold, he sends a tweet saying, it's cold outside, give me some global warming. But climate denial is not funny. Climate change is real, and I see it every day in my job, the devastating impacts that it's having on the planet. The world has warmed about one degree since 1850. But that one degree figure doesn't begin to capture the whole picture, because the air has actually warmed much more over land than it has over oceans. And it's warmed even further at the poles than it has around the planet as a whole. And that's triggered an accelerating rate of melting ice. And we're looking at about one meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. So sometimes I feel a bit like I'm on the apocalypse beat covering the end of the world. The motion before us tonight is this house would break the law to save the planet. And I oppose this motion because I believe that breaking the law cannot be at the core of our response to this monumental challenge. This is a global crisis, and any real solution needs to include everyone, not only those who can afford to break the law. And breaking the law cannot sustain the long-term policy response that is needed. To dive into that first point, focusing on breaking the law to save the planet is an approach that excludes a lot of people. In fact, it excludes the very people who are most impacted by the impacts of climate change. What does breaking the law mean for a family in the Marshall Islands who have already lost their home to rising seas? How does breaking the law solve the problems of the herdsmen in the Sahel whose homeland has been torn apart by conflict after years of drought? Sitting here in this room, we are all speaking from a great position of privilege to even be able to discuss this openly. Police aren't going to rush in here and arrest anyone. We can all just have a nice <coughs> discussion about whether or not breaking the law is a good idea without any fear of recrimination for what we say here tonight. But that approach does not extend very far beyond these borders. I used to be based in China, and working there as a journalist is to experience what it is like to be in a society that lacks the rule of law. If an environmental activist gets arrested there, it is not going to be in the newspapers. It's not going to be in the headlines. It's not going to have a ripple effect. You will just get censored out of existence. And I grant that Extinction Rebellion has had a huge impact here in the UK. In the past year since they've been acted, active, the UK has passed a net zero law for 2050. And that is amazing. That is going in the right direction. But the law-breaking strategies that have an impact here are really irrelevant in the places where they are most needed. Carbon dioxide is emitted everywhere, and what we really need is a global solution. China is the world's largest emitter of carbon dioxide. It emits more than the US and the EU. So unless they stop emitting, we're all stuck in this together. I'd also like to point out that there is a big distinction between breaking the law and protesting legally for a cause that you believe in. In a democratic society, legal demonstrations can be every bit as effective as illegal ones. Look at Greta Thunberg and the student climate strikers. What they were doing was not illegal, and yet they had a huge impact in changing the debate. You don't need to break the law to bring about a huge change. Big, flashy protests can be a starting point, and they can be a spark. Jane Fonda can get arrested on the steps of Capitol Hill, and I know Gail likes handcuffs over here. <laughs> but ultimately, all of these acts of protests are only meaningful if they lead to policy. Once the issue has been made visible and brought to the public eye, civil disobedience cannot sustain the long-term solution. Civil disobedience may be necessary, but it is not sufficient to bring the change we would like to see. 
let's look at three areas that need a huge amount of change if we're even going to begin to address the climate crisis. Our energy consumption, material consumption, and food consumption all need dramatic changes. Energy is by far the biggest source of emissions, accounting for about two-thirds of greenhouse gas emissions. And to change this, governments need to remove fossil fuel subsidies, put a high price in carbon, invest in energy storage, upgrade the grid. We can't keep the lights on and decarbonize unless we have the right policies in place. With material consumption, it's the same story. Western economies are built on a culture of convenience and overconsumption, one that is clearly incompatible with living within our planetary boundaries. Individual choices can make a difference, but that's only to an extent. We need change that is inclusive across the whole society, whether that begins with attacks on single-use plastics, attacks on fast fashion. Policy is an important lever that we need to use. Food is the same story. Agriculture and land use account for about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, roughly the same level as China. So why not tax meat? Why not make eliminating food waste a top priority? In all of these areas, energy, material consumption, and food, having the right policies in place turns out to be key, and getting the right policies is really hard. That's where the hard work begins. And breaking the laws people have alluded to can also detract from positive policy making because it can alienate people. And for these kind of sweeping changes, we need everyone on board. Surely the only real solution to climate change is a deeper understanding of environmental justice. Surely the only real way forward is to learn to live with less and to be willing to make sacrifices. Climate change is the ultimate challenge to humanity because it is a test of whether we can become better, wiser human beings. Can we be more altruistic, more cooperative? Can we build better systems? Can we imagine a world in which humans survive and even thrive, and yet we also protect the planet? Climate change has already happened to the world we live in and is going to continue happening even if we stop emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow. The worst effects may still be in the future, but for many people in the world, particularly in the Global South, the effects are already being felt and have been felt for years. The proposition has argued that we must break the law to save the planet, that this is imperative. But that approach misses the point. Surely the more important question is, what do we do to save the planet for ourselves and for future generations? What is the best solution? Breaking the law may, may seem appealing in the short term, but breaking the law alone does not hold the answers. We can't just tear down the edifice. We have to build something that works. We can't descend into anarchy. That is the last thing that would help the planet. At the heart of my opponent's message tonight has been a kind of nihilism and despair, and that is the opposite of what is needed to address a crisis that is both very urgent and very long-term. We must try to stop climate change. And we must deal with a problem that is going to be with us for a very long time. We can't just glue ourselves to the sidewalk. We need solutions that include everybody, not just the people in this room, not just the people in the UK. We need solutions that value all human life equally. Addressing climate change requires a degree of human cooperation that is unlike anything we have ever undertaken. Breaking the law is not going to take us down that path. For all these reasons, I would say, vote with the nose tonight. Vote your conscience, and whichever way you vote, act on your conscience too. After you leave this room, go out and get involved. Just don't glue yourself to anything on your way out. Thank you.